Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast, a podcast of Wheaton College. Some people disliked his metaphors. He said at one point, Jesus, if he wasn't God, he claimed he could forgive everyone's sins and forgive people's sins, which an ordinary person wouldn't do. Lewis thought it was more shocking, not that he healed people, but that he claimed to forgive their sins. Mm. And he said, someone who did that, if they weren't the son of God, they would be a, a lunatic of the sort that would claim he might be a poached egg. And people were very <laughs> offended by that metaphor. They said, what are you saying? Jesus is a lunatic who was like someone who... So there were critiques of his specific metaphors, but overall it was very well received. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. Today, our producer, Aaron Hill, is joining David and I to talk about the wireless. We titled this episode, Down to the Wireless, and a lot of people under the age of 50, when they hear the word wireless, think we're talking about Wi-Fi, but this was actually the term used for radio when many of our authors were writing. And everybody who listens to this podcast knows about C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, but some may not realize that it first appeared on the wireless. Yes, uh, Mere Christianity is now a classic. It sells more copies now in China than it did in Britain when it was first published in 1952. But I think uh, many people who listen to this podcast probably know it was originally a series of BBC uh, pod, uh, broadcast. You I said, said podcast. podcast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> BBC radio broadcast. Yeah, BBC radio, because there was no TV in 1941. I call it an accidental classic because when Mere Christianity came out in 52, there were no reviews, there was no hoopla, there was no fanfare because it was a republication of some smaller booklets that were based on Lewis's BBC broadcast. Mere Christianity, uh, it wasn't intended to be a book and it wasn't even intended to be four sets of broadcast. A fellow named Ashley Sampson that Jeffrey Bless really liked Out of the Silent Planet mm. and said, you have a lot of things to say about theology. Could you write a book for us on the problem of evil, which was the problem of pain? And then J.W. Welch at the BBC read the problem of pain and said, oh, I would love to have this fellow speak on the radio. This is during the war about uh, the basic case for Christianity, why he's a Christian. People don't realize that it, the BBC is not quite like ABC and NBC. It had a religious charter. They had a certain portion of their time set out for religious programming. Uh, in fact, Welch was a Christian, and the editor of the broadcast talks was also a Christian and Presbyterian. So Lewis got the invitation to do the broadcast talks in 1941, February. The war was already on in Britain, and actually it was dangerous for him to travel to London because the BBC headquarters in London had been bombed twice. Oh, one wow. Time, one time during a broadcast. You could hear the, the uh, destruction happening in the background. Oh, wow. But the offices of the religious programming office had evacuated to Bristol after the bombing. So they went to Bristol, and then they went to Bedford. Well, uh, Lewis went to London, I believe, to uh, Oh, so they must have evacuated after that? Yeah, it must have been after that. Oh, wow. Originally, he was invited to do four talks on why I believe in Christianity, and he did what's now book one of Mere Christianity. Mm -hmm. The previous summer, he'd been invited to speak to RAF personnel at their bases to, for morale purposes, and he called himself a complete failure. He said, I'm like Balaam's ass. I'm trying to get the word out, but I'm just not being very... Mm. Uh, effective. He discovered that when he used the word creature, meaning created by God, yeah. people thought he meant animal, like all creatures, great and small. And he said, when he used the word authority, they all said, well, why should we take something on authority? So part of it's interesting that you the would talks, think soldiers would be used to taking things on authority. Well, their idea was, well, if I can't see it for myself, if I don't have empirical evidence, why should I believe in it? And in uh, Mere Christianity, he says, I've never seen New York City. I take it on authority that there is a big city in America called New York City. So uh, ironically, even though he, he felt like a failure as an RAF lecturer, it helped him sharpen his talks in the Mere Christianity. Mm. They were so popular. He did originally was asked to do four talks, and there was so much mail that he was asked to do a fifth talk. The original talks were preceded by the news in Norwegian and followed by Welsh folk songs. So he didn't have a real sweet <laughs> slot on the BBC. 
but he was so interesting. They loved his delivery. His uh, editor, Eric Finn, said, your scripts have such startling clarity. And apparently listeners felt the same way. People mm-hmm. would be in pubs. George Sayer, his biographer, said he was in a pub once. And when Lewis's voice came on, everybody went quiet. They all wanted to hear what he had to say for 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. It's kind of ironic because today people are saying that mere Christianity is so difficult and they have trouble understanding it. When in the 1940s, it was just a a success story for clarity that could speak mm, to right, mass audiences. Right. Yeah. Well, there wasn't wasn't that much popular theology. It tended to be either academic theology or else you just took what you heard in church. And he was one of the first people to really show what a lay theologian could do to reach the, the audience. So was the material that Lewis spoke to the RAF personnel, was that the same material? Is he just workshopping this material before he then takes it to the BBC? Or was that failure what gave him direction for, in other words, were the talks the same at all? Or or is this just a matter of they asked him to do this for the radio and he had already learned from his bad experience? Well, the whole thing was not planned. I would say it's, as I say, mere Christianity, I call it an accidental classic, but you should probably call it a providential classic. Mm. At first, he was asked to write Problem of Pain. And then he was asked to speak to RAF personnel. He discovered where the audience is coming from. In one of his early speeches, he talked about Pauline soteriology. And he could see people looking at their watches and yawning. Yeah, Uh, They would be checking their email if they had iPhones back then, but they didn't. And so he suddenly switched gears and said, I believe that many prostitutes and pawnbrokers will be closer to the throne of God in heaven than many people who attend church. And everybody looked up and said, what did he just say? Yeah. And so having a real audience there was really helpful for him because he Mm. could read people's responses. Yeah. And so they were actually separate, but he'd done the, he actually, he's such an earnest guy. Here is this, this established professor. People ask him to get on a train every weekend and go to Scotland or Wales or Northern England and speak to RAF. And he felt that it was his duty to help not only boost their morale, but also to give some spiritual foundations for what they were doing. Yeah. So that was a separate invitation. When the invitation came to be on the BBC radio, he said, well, I've learned a few things from talking to the RAF personnel, Mm -hmm. so maybe I can do a better job on the radio. Yes. For those at home who don't know, Pauline soteriology means (laughs) Paul's theology of salvation. So, Right. Thank you. Do you (laughs) want to explain what a prostitute is as well? (laughs) No, I don't need to. (laughs) No. But, you know, if people back then didn't know, people today might not know. (laughs) Yeah, good. Thank you. Soteriology is one of those words that um, theologians like to use that make them sound really fancy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Soteriology and eschatology and all the ecclesiology, all those ologies, you know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So he learned how to adapt his ideas and his vocabulary to a more general audience because you can I can foresee a situation where he doesn't go and speak to the RAF soldiers and he doesn't speak in front of these audiences and they invite him to do this BBC talk. Right. And he's up there just pontificating as a professor talking about Pauline soteriology and everybody's just like, click, turn off the radio, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Which is a great lesson for all of us because he spent all summer going to these RAF meetings and giving talks and felt like a total failure. Mm -hmm. But he didn't realize Mm -hmm. he was learning something really valuable. It would Mm -hmm. put him in good stead for the BBC talks. Yeah, you can learn a lot from your failures. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And you will be surprised to know that Dorothy Sayers... (laughs) (laughs) Dorothy Sayers was really key in this process, as well as an important person who had been hired to be in charge of religious broadcasting for BBC Radio. And David, you mentioned him, Mm J.W. Welch or James Welch. And what was important about James Welch, he was a Anglican clergyman with more evangelical leanings, but he is the first person to suggest that talks about Christianity on the radio might be given by lay people. Mm-hmm. Before 1939, this had not been done before. Oh, wow. And James Welsh has this vision that there are important Christians who might be able to speak to audiences better than mm. people who just want to talk about Pauline and soteriology <laughs> or 
uh, people who just, in fact, one person that had been interviewed and on the radio, he was just saying, well, why worry about the creeds? It's just how you feel about Jesus. And oh my goodness, um, something that both Lewis and Sayers would pull out their hair over. So James Welch is really important to this whole process. Mm. But also, once he got permission from the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he had to get permission to allow lay people to talk about Christianity on BBC radio, Mm -hmm. one of the early individuals he invited to talk about Christianity on the radio Mm -hmm. was Dorothy Sayers. Mm -hmm. She was invited months before C.S. Lewis was ever invited. Uh Uh-oh. Now... (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Now, part of it is she had been recruited to write a a nativity play that was performed on the radio. So speaking Mm -hmm. parts on the radio. It was um, called He That Should Come Ah. about the baby Jesus. And she took, as Dorothy Sayers always did, a very unique approach. It was extremely popular. Mm. So... She, her voice wasn't part of this play, but J- James Welsh was familiar with her name. And, of course, she was more famous in 1940 than C.S. Lewis was. Really? Yeah. Oh, definitely. So here's a question, Crystal. How did Sayers get into the religious aspect of this? You know, because she gets her start writing detective novels, kind of becomes known for that. She's working in advertising. You wrote an article about her sort of connection with cinema and that world. How does she then transition to uh, being seen as a theological authority that should speak on the radio or write these Christian plays? That is a really great question, and I spend quite a bit of time talking about it in a book that is coming out this fall called Subversive. And the key incident in Sayer's life, she was born to a clergyman. She was the only child of a clergyman. So she grew up just mm-hmm. assuming Christianity was true. But it was one of, or at least my interpretation is, it's very similar to children today who grow up and they kind of keep their Christianity in a separate box from Mm. the rest of their life. And so they never doubt that Jesus died and rose from the dead. But it's just not something that makes a difference to their daily existence. Mm. Sayers then, in 1936, was asked to write a play for the Canterbury Cathedral Festival. And two years before her, T.S. Eliot wrote The Famous Murder in the Cathedral. The year after T.S. Eliot, Charles Williams wrote a play for the Canterbury Festival. And as far as we can tell, Williams suggested the name of Sayers to write oh. the, the next Canterbury play. Gotcha. Sayers reluctantly agreed. Williams and Eliot were considered much more intellectual, Mm -hmm. literary types, where she was a best-selling author. And in her day, there was kind of this disdain of people who would write a bestseller. I mean, she's just this, you know, cheesy Lord Peter Whimsy books. Mm -hmm. I wonder if anybody picked up Murder in Cathedral by T.S. Eliot thinking it was a detective novel. (laughs) (laughs) well since he wasn't known for um writing detective novels it sounds like a good detective novel yeah yeah yeah. um so writing this play it was performed in the chapter house of the cathedral and it was the requirement is it had to be something about the history of canterbury cathedral oh okay so she turned it into a history about an actual architect who redesigned and rebuilt part of the cathedral after it had been burned down by fire in the 12th century. But that forced her to think about something that she was grappling with on a secular level, and that is the integrity of work. Mm -hmm. And she realized, oh, but the content of this play needs to be about Christianity because this is about the history of this great building that was constructed in praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And it really brought together these different parts of her life that she had kept in separate boxes and put them together. And that changed her life. After the success of her play, which was called The Zeal of Thy House, Mm -hmm. it actually went on and played in London. 
she got all these requests to speak on Christian subjects. She actually says in one of her letters, she had no intent to become a Christian apologist. (laughs) This was not of interest to her. But because she was a brilliant woman, she was saying things, and she very similar to C.S. Lewis insofar as she was putting abstruse soteriology Uh into the language of common people. And, you know, a best-selling author should be able to, to do that. Yeah. And so once Archbishop of Canterbury gave permission to have lay people talk on the radio about Christianity, she was one of the early people asked huh. to do it because she was a big name. Yeah. 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 People knew her. Right. And Lewis was only starting to get known, as David just said, about the problem of pain. Well, he'd only written, uh, it, well, he had the poem Dimer he wrote for his Christian. And then he had Pilgrim's Regress and Out of the Silent Planet. And the Problem of Pain came out in 1940. So he was just emerging as someone that uh, people would recognize his name. It's interesting that Welch actually wrote and said, we'd like you to do Why I'm a Christian by a lay person. What you just said a second ago. Uh, They wanted to get people that were normal Christians uh, on Mm -hmm. the radio talking about their faith. The other, uh, Welch said, if you don't want to talk about that, you could talk about a Christian perspective on contemporary literature. And Lewis passed on that topic. (laughs) And it's one of those forks in the road. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you know the butterfly effect that a a butterfly's wings, apparently in terms of the weather could create a a storm chaos theory. But to me, it's fascinating that someone liked out of the silent planet and so they asked him to write Problem of Pain, and then someone else liked Problem of Pain and said, could you do some talks on BBC Radio? Yeah. And Lewis never chose to become a Christian apologist either. He was like Dorothy Sayers. He never set out and said, I'm going to be a spokesperson for the Christian faith. That ended up becoming a life-changing moment for him, even yeah. though he didn't realize it. Yeah, He was he- paid like $50 per broadcast, and he gave them away to charity. So he saw it as just a little kind of side job that he was doing apart from being a professor and a professional scholar. Wow. We don't have any evidence for this, but because Sayers had done her broadcasts in August of 1940 and James Welch really valued Sayers, she she was famous for not um, just giving platitudes. She shocked people the way she talked. And she, in fact, insisted that uh, later, when she was asked to do some more radio broadcasts about Christianity, she said, you can't call them um, the son of God because that leads too much to the Arian heresy that, oh, God, Mm. you know, created this Mm -hmm. being named Jesus who kind of did the dirty work for him. And she said that's how a lot of people thought about it because of the phrase son of God. And so she insisted on saying, no, it's God the Son. And she talked about the murder of God. I mean, people mm. were shocked. Yeah. Mm. That language, they, in church, they don't say, yeah. well, God was murdered. Yeah. And it shocked people into thinking about Christianity in, in a new way. Yeah, crucifixion um, is a very sanitized word exactly. in our right, minds. Right. But yeah. then to use the word murdered all of a sudden makes it real, kind of brings it into the moment. Luce does that in his broadcast talks, which became mere Christianity. He says, what you have to believe is that the Son of God was killed for our sakes. He doesn't say crucified. He says killed. Yeah, It has that same yeah. kind of yeah. real gut feeling of someone was murdered or assassinated for our sakes. So, so can I put forward a little theory here and then you guys can react to it? So I think you mentioned about providence. So knowing a little bit of historical theology, because I do have a master's degree in theology. <laughs> uh, hence why you know about soteriology. Yes, hence that. Um, can I mention here I have a PhD in English? You do, you do. <laughs> Both of you have PhDs and I don't. Uh, what I was going to say is England's spiritual condition as a nation before the war and after the war were markedly different. Um, As you said, you know, Sayers grew up under a pastor and Lewis's testimony of sort of growing up in the church is very similar as sort of dry, dead religion. There's the Mm -hmm. husk of religion, there's the institutions and there's the hierarchy and the church is still entangled with the state. But I wouldn't describe England's religion or Christianity before World War II as being much alive. Um, right. I can back that up. Um, George Marston has a really good book on mere Christianity. And he says that 50% of uh, English people describe themselves as Anglicans. 
but it was very nominal. It's yeah. what they call the the bells and knells. You go there for your marriage, baptism, marriage, baptism. and funerals, right? Yeah. Right. It's a very institutional thing, but it wasn't much of a personal relationship or you know right. faith relationship. Right. And so much of it was just about the importance of tradition. Yeah, and still. Well, maybe not to this day, but when David and I started going to England in the 80s, mm-hmm. in our youth, <laughs> um, we had these incidents. One time we were standing side by side in line to get a ticket for the tube and because we were talking and a woman with um, blue hair tapped David on the back uh, with her umbrella and this total stranger, and she was standing behind him, and she said, "Here in Britain, we queue properly." <laughs> and she wanted us to stand, you know, in line, not side by side, oh, so that wow. David was behind me. So you queue properly, yeah, and you go to church on Sundays, yeah, and so queuing up to take Eucharist was not much different than queuing up mm. to get your tube ticket. Yeah. You right. just follow tradition. And the language that they used in their services, the liturgy, the Book of Common Prayer, was very antiquated and older. And so a lot of the terms that were being used were just sort of going over the average everyday people's heads. And you see this shift that happens in the war where they're developing a religious consciousness. They're sort of renewing their faith as a country. But I, I, my theory is they're looking for people that can make that communication translation, that can take what are these ideas they maybe grew up with, but they didn't really believe and put them in average everyday language for people. They're sort of looking for lay authorities in that respect. And you right. see Sayers and Lewis and other people sort of step into that gap after the war or mm-hmm. during the war. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, Marston says that uh, one in four people during the war, we always think of the good old days when people were so spiritual and they were so mm-hmm. devout. He said one in four people in Britain could not identify what we're celebrating at Easter. Yeah. Wow. They said it's springtime or it's Christianity in general, but they couldn't say it's about the resurrection. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, every, England was very secularized, and then both England and America had a renewal during and after the war. Yeah. So I, I only mention that because I think that's helpful to see how they would look at what Sayers is doing and what Lewis is doing and how they're translating these ideas and this theology into average everyday speech is like this revelation, this new thing and, and suddenly opening up this world that had been opaque to them, you know, the right, sort right. of bells and knells uh, religion suddenly becomes real to them in a way in this moment of existential dread of world war two and threat of invasion and all these kinds of things. Mm hmm. I think we should add yells, bells, and knells. That would be like a little baby and then wedding bells. Oh, and then, okay. <laughs> yells, bells, and knells. Yeah, right. that, would be, that would be a lot of people's religious experience. One of the metaphors that both Sayers and Lewis used for this type of passive capitulation to Christianity before the war was stained glass window Christianity. Mm. It's it's beautiful. We value the beauty of Christianity. We go to the churches and we see the stained glass of Jesus born in a manger and even the stained glass of the crucifixion. It's neat and tidy. Yeah. You don't think of it as murder that God took on flesh and was murdered. Yeah. And so they both just blasted out the stained glass windows Mm -hmm. of contemporary thought while the Nazis were literally blasting out stained glass Mm -hmm. windows of churches that that they were bombing. Yeah, definitely. And Lewis used a lot of timely metaphors in his broadcast talks, which became mere Christianity. He was talking about morality, and he said, in order to have a successful convoy, you have to have all the individual boats are in good working order. They have good engines. They have good rudders. They know how to steer and to move forward. They need to be in right relationship to the other boats, keep a safe distance, but stay together as a convoy. And then they need to have the proper destination. They're trying to get to Halifax or New York City or wherever. And he said, that's like morality. You need to think about what's going on inside of you. uh, But then you need to think about your relationships with other people. And then you need to think about your ultimate destination. What is the point of morality? And it's a brilliant and very timely metaphor mm. to compare 
the, the dimensions of morality to a successful convoy. And at that time, everybody understood exactly what he was talking about. Yeah, they were in the news. They were getting uh, uh, torpedoed by the Nazi submarines and all those kinds of things. Today, Mm -hmm. if I started talking about, if I use that metaphor about a convoy, people would be like, what is he talking about? Yeah, Yeah. that's true. He has another one uh, where he talks about, we're in occupied territory. The the archangel of Earth, Lucifer, has taken over and uh, put the entire planet in a state of rebellion. And when you become a Christian, you're a part of the resistance. And when you meet in church, you're you're encouraging each other and you're passing messages and you're waiting for the invasion when the allies will come and liberate us. So once again, the, his listeners knew exactly what the metaphor was, that yeah. we're like the French resistance trying waiting for the liberation to come. Yeah. He, d- he uses that in Out of the Silent Planet, um, mm-hmm, you know, this idea that sort of, you know, there's... We're in enemy occupied territory, right. you know, stuck within right. the bounds of Earth. Uh, it's interesting, yeah. David, were there any critiques of the broadcast talks when they first came out? Um, I can't think. There were critiques of mere Christianity. As I say, it didn't have uh, a lot of fanfare when it came out in 52. Uh, some people felt like he oversimplified things. Lewis said at one point that anybody can use a lot of academic jargon to make a point. Uh, but to really reach the average listener or the average reader is a real gift. And he was hoping a lot of people would follow up on his work. Some people disliked his metaphors. He said at one point, Jesus, if he wasn't God, he claimed he could forgive everyone's sins and forgive people's sins, which an ordinary person wouldn't do. Lewis thought it was more shocking that not that, not that he healed people, but he claimed to forgive their sins. Mm. And he said, someone who did that, if they weren't the son of God, they would be a, a lunatic of the sort that would uh, claim he might be a poached egg. And people were very offended by that metaphor. They said, what are you saying? Jesus is a lunatic who is like someone who... So there were critiques of his specific metaphors, but overall it was very well received. But once again, because they were used to a stained glass view of Christianity, it's just you have to keep using the same comfortable language Mm. because it's about tradition. You line up in a queue, you line up your words in the proper order, and they better be King James English words. (laughs) <laughs> In fact, this leads to the famous incident. We've talked about this on podcasts before, where uh, in 1940, Sayers was also asked to write her famous uh, 12 radio plays about yeah. the life of Jesus. And she got into major trouble, this huge scandal, because she didn't use King James English. Yeah. So that's a perfect example that Christianity for even the Christians, like the Lord's Day Observance Society, Observance Society, the um, the Protestant Truth Society. So oh, these wow. were earnest Christian societies. So these were people who took their faith seriously. They're the ones who protested the loudest. You've got to use King James English. Yeah. How dare you have an actor pretending to be Jesus by oh, voicing wow. his lines. There had been a law, a 300-year-old law passed by the Puritans in the 17th century that no one could impersonate Jesus. Uh-huh. And once again, so that was a 300-year-old tradition. You cannot impersonate Jesus. Yeah. So she kept shocking people out of their comfort zones, yeah. but that's what was effective yeah. because, as um, is very well known, Due to the scandal and the protests and demands for censorship of her radio plays, thousands of people tuned in who would never listen to religious broadcasting. And for the first time in their lives, they understood what Christianity was about because the language was different. Yeah, controversy mm. draws a crowd. We uh, we, yeah. d- we did an episode uh, a while back in the spring uh, on Man Born to be King. Yes. So if you guys want to go listen to that, it's called Rediscovering the Man Born to be King, I think, with Crystal and Christine Cologne and then uh, Marjorie Meter, Associate Director at The Wade. So if you want to learn more about the Man Born to be King, we've got a whole podcast on that. And the same thing happened to Lewis. Originally was asked to do four broadcasts on the BBC of 15 minutes, but they got so much mail, they added a fifth one on a Saturday rather than a Wednesday, which was a much better slot. And it was so successful. They got a million viewers. They asked him to do a second one. And so he did uh, what Christians believe on Christian doctrine. And that was so successful, they asked for a third one. And then finally a fourth one. When you read Mere Christianity now, it seems very logically put together. There's 
an opening on why we, sh- we, we all believe in some general morality, a law of human nature, and we all realize that we're breaking it. And the second one's on basic Christian doctrine. And the third one is on Christian ethics. It talks about the cardinal virtues. And then the fourth one is on Christian theology. And it seems very logically laid out, but actually these developed piece by piece into place and became mere Christianity. Hmm. But it really was the audience response. They were obviously hungry for someone to explain these beliefs in terms they could understand rather than just the uh, language they were finding in the Book of Common Prayer and in the sermons they were hearing. Yeah, mm-hmm. Crystal, so uh, well, you didn't. I kind of interrupted you earlier. My apologies. Hmm. So what did Sayers talk about when she gave her talks? What were those actual talks that she gave, not her, the plays? Her first two, one was called Christ of the Creeds, and she was really trying to get people to see that Christ is God, not just God's henchman. Um, and then the next one is related. She called it the sacrament of matter. Ooh. And that, people go, sacrament of matter? What? What do you mean? And she was making the point that matter matters. Yeah. The very fact that God was willing to take on flesh sanctifies flesh itself and there is often what is known as a docetic response mm-hmm. among Christians. Docetism was an early heresy in the church that said that Christ only seemed to be human. It was yeah. kind of like an apparition, but it was, just, it was God because people were just shocked that God could take on flesh. And it's ironic because, of course, that is one of the basic doctrines of Christian orthodoxy, but people had lost that doctrine that matter matters. Yeah. That that God has endorsed the flesh by being willing to take it on. Yeah. Lewis made the same point in uh, his broadcast talks. He said, God likes matter. He made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but still you could have this separation. Yeah. God made nice little earth mm-hmm. to for human enjoyment, but then is just so transcendent. Yeah. But docetism, I ran into it in my early teaching career at another Christian college where I was talking about the poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins. And um, Hopkins, this just godly person, was struggling with sin and lust. And I just said in the classroom, and we say, well, we know that Jesus, Jesus was tempted by lust. He didn't sin but he was tempted by lust. And of course, that's Hebrews 4.15. You yeah. know, Jesus was tempted in every way. We are, though, without sin. One of my students went home and told her mother that I said Jesus was tempted by lust, and the mother called the school and demanded that I be fired. Wow. She didn't realize I was just alluding to Scripture, but wow. also it just shows that docetism, you cannot talk about physical things in mm. relationship to Jesus. And this is a passion that, that Sayers and Lewis shared. It's part of the reason they became such good friends. Mm. It's a common belief, I would say, among all of our uh, seven authors of the way. Chesterton uh, mm. and McDonald are you know, big advocates of this. I, I would say that it's also tied to um, this idea that sort of everything that is eternal, God's essence, the sort of divine essence is unchanging. It's eternal. It's spiritual. And so this idea that God would take on flesh, which we see as temporary and fleeting, and I mean, at least in the churches that I grew up in, there was very often a dirty connotation attached to the flesh. You know, when you read Paul and he talks about the flesh, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and people kind of confuse those things. Um, And so, yeah, there's very much this idea Mm -hmm. of like, well, because God's pure and he's divine and he's unchanging, he wouldn't take on something that's fleeting and dirty and temporal and all these kinds of things. And it's kind of like we miss the idea that part of the reason he did that was to redeem (laughs) the the material world. It's it's very platonic, the idea that everything that's perfect and ideal and timeless exists in the The realm of ideas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's a, I would say that's a common, uh, I think, belief that's in a lot of Christianity, at least Protestantism especially. And so it, it makes sense that when 
you know, Sayers is speaking about that on the radio, that that would be mm-hmm. a scandalous thing to talk about. Right. Kind of like you in your, in your classroom at the co- Christian college. Yeah. And she called up the mother and said, you dosis this. <laughs> that really. <laughs> D-O-C-E. T-I-S-M. Docetism. Yeah. Which and, is uh, Greek for stupid idea? No. What does docetism mean? <laughs> it comes from a Greek word that means to seem. Christ oh, only, seem. Jesus the, only seemed the oh, okay. to you. be yes. God. And the famous docetist was a bishop of the church. So this was a leader in early Christianity, Marcion. Mm-hmm. And his argument is that, well, of course God couldn't take flesh because flesh is filled with excrement. And when when you put it that way, I mean, that is shocking. We don't want to think of Jesus doing fleshly things, but this is the brilliance of Christianity. Yeah. Unlike other religions that tend to favor that there's the world of the flesh, the um this binary between the flesh and the transcendent. Yeah. That's why I love being married to Crystal. If somebody said, in this podcast, will the word excrement be spoken? <laughs> I doubt it. And you go, well, no, actually, it did come up at yeah. one point. Hey, yeah. hey, this is part of church history. You can see, though, I would also say that you can see uh, where that, where doth, docetism thrives, the resurrection is, and the incarnation are not given as much prominence. And so, um, um, because what's the point of putting on flesh again, right? What's, you know, otherwise mm. you... You get saved by what Jesus does on the cross. You pray that prayer. And then when you die, you leave your flesh and all the dirtiness behind and you go to this spiritual realm to be in heaven. And the idea of a new heaven and a new earth and a resurrected body is spiritualized. You know, um, it's not an actual physical place that you can, I'm knocking on wood right now. You can't hear that on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but you see that in, I would argue, you see that really prominently in um, Sayers and her focus on the incarnation and, mm. and Lewis's focus on the resurrection. And so, He yeah. also tied it to communion. He felt that physically taking mm. uh, the bread and the yes. wine as the body and blood of Christ was just a, a weekly reminder that we are yeah. assimilating God's nature through physical things. The sacrament yeah. of matter, right. the matter of yeah. Eucharist. Right is just an extension of that. One of the things you talked about earlier, David, was this famous line that Lewis used about Jesus being a lunatic, and he uses it in Problem of Pain as well as Mere Christianity. And you mentioned lunatic like a poached egg was that one. (laughs) Um, And I remember learning in college that Lewis made this famous statement that for Jesus to proclaim what he did, he had to be either a lunatic, a liar, or the Lord. Mm-hmm. And that's straight out of C.S. Lewis. But Lewis never makes that alliterative statement. And he doesn't. The idea there is, but that particular he has phrase the doesn't idea. appear. Right. Um, so, and if you try Googling it, it, people attribute it to him, but they can never show oh. an original document. Okay, this is my next writing project. Oh, I was going to say, who, just... who wrote it? Who wrote it, Crystal? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> um, it was Sayers. <laughs> Dorothy Sayers. She in, um, okay, here's the background, and this is something I want to research more. They were so pleased with Sayers. Broad, her own broadcast talks, although her voice was kind of high and she talked fast and some people had trouble with that. But I think there was also the gender thing. Mm. Um, they would get letters that, well, I can't be preached to by a woman. Ooh. But yeah. Um, but for most people, because of her fame, they did. They go, wow, this famous best selling detective fiction author believes in Jesus, that Jesus was God in the flesh. Anyway, so one of the workers at the BBC had grown up in the church. He was employed in the religious broadcasting department, but Sayers was saying these things that he, they were just blowing him away because he had this more conventional, mm-hmm. traditional... Stained glass window. Stained thing. glass right. window Christianity. And so... He wrote her a letter saying, well, how can you say this? How can you say this? And she wrote this long um, response, very earnest response. And he showed it to James Welsh and said, this is the first time I've really understood Christian doctrine. 
Oh, wow. And so Welch asked Sayers permission if they could read parts of her letter on future broadcast talks. Oh, wow. And so she got permission of, um, from the recipient. But part of that letter, she was saying, um, she cites the lunatic reference in Lewis, but then she's the one who goes on in this letter to say, well, he was either a liar, a lunatic, or, and she doesn't use the word Lord, but then she talks about, or the prince of all salvation who died for our sins. So I'm wondering if when the BBC divided this letter up into um, other broadcast talks, Mm. if one of the BBC people finished the alliteration and did lunatic liar because the lunatic and liar was Sayers and they added Lord because that's what she was saying. So I would have to go to England and look at transcripts um, based on this letter that Sayers wrote, but they not only had her speaking, they would send her scripts that other people were writing for broadcasts and ask her response. They so respected her editing skills yeah. as well as her own theological insight. Huh. And Dorothy Sayers also came up with It Takes One to Know One. <laughs> Is that Dorothy Sayers? <laughs> it's amazing. She was just... <laughs> well, okay. she, did, she did work in advertising for a while, so she clearly, yeah. she clearly had a knack for that kind of As far as we can tell, she's the person who coined It Pays to Advertise. Really? Wow. Yeah, that's uh, scholars. Uh, it's speculation because it's nowhere in print. Mm. But everybody who knew her at the advertising firm said, oh, yeah, Dorothy came up with that. Interesting. That's sort of like um, I've been fascinated with trying to get to the bottom of where the myth of G.K. Uh, Chesterton writing into the newspaper saying, you know, what's wrong with the world? Oh, right. I am. Mm-hmm. There's no proof that he ever wrote that. Oh. There's no newspaper article. I've looked. There's no there's no record of it. And yeah. Dale Alquist actually has on the Chesterton Society and a, 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 a blog post that basically says, we have no proof that he ever wrote this. We don't know where it came from. If you have any sort of sources or indication that this came from someplace, we'd love to hear it. Yeah. But it's a very commonly told anecdote right. about Chesterton. And he did publish a book called What's Wrong with right. the World. Right, right, right. And so I think somebody sort of created this story because there, he has this book writ- that he wrote that's a c- compilation of articles called What's Wrong with the World. And somebody sort of came up with this anecdote and then it's just gotten passed around so much right. that everybody takes it as truth. But when you, I've been digging now for probably a year and a half, two years, and I just, there's no. Uh, evidence that he ever actually wrote into a newspaper and wrote, wow. you know, I am as a, as a letter. It makes a great story. But, yeah, it does. Um, it's kind of like Washington, I cannot tell a lie. Yeah. Well, there's a uh, Lewis quotation, which I wonder if he was influenced by that story. Someone wrote to Lewis and said, what is a soul? And he wrote back and said, I am, or any consciousness that can say I am. Yeah. So he used the same idea in a different context. Did he actually write that though? Yeah, that's in a letter. Yes. Oh, so I wonder if somebody... Combined oh, Lewis's letter yeah, with they Chesterton's alighted book the and two his stories. ideas. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, interesting. Mm-hmm. There's a book by William Flaherty called The Misquotable Lewis, and it's on all the things that are attributed to Lewis. He oh, yeah. tracks them down and finds out whether they were not, oh, yeah. uh, whether they were actually said by Lewis or not. So, Crystal, where can, I think everybody knows where to find Mere Christianity. <laughs> Just <laughs> look on a bookshelf near you and you'll right. find a copy. But where can people find these talks that Sayers gave? What, how have they been republished? I know that Zeal of Thy House and Man Born to be King and some of these other places have been republished as their own standalone right. books. But what about uh, her talks? They languished in the archives at the Wade for decades. And finally, a professor at, at Lille Catholic University mm-hmm. in Lille, France. Yeah, that scholar, Suzanne Bray. Came and looked through them, and she transcribed these um, Sayers broadcast talks in a book that we have at the Wade called 
the Christ of the creeds and other broadcast mes- messages to the British people during World War II. And she provides an introduction and overview. So it's from Bray's book that I know as much as I do. It ha- and the book was published by the Dorothy L. Sayers Society in gotcha. conjunction with the, with the Wade Center. So I'll provide a link uh, where you may be able to buy a copy of that online. It, I don't know that maybe that's probably not widely available, though, unfortunately. It may not be. Hmm. Well, maybe that's something we should try and remedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're talking about books. There's a good book called Mere Christians, which is testimonies of all the people that were really influenced by mere Christianity. Hmm. That's very Marianne Fimister, who's a friend of the Wade. Yeah. And uh, people like uh, Francis Collins of the Human Genome Project yes. and Charles Coulson and uh, Anne Rice, the, the novelist, uh, all became Christians. And uh, David Downing is and in David the book. And David Downing is in the book, yes. Uh, it's a fascinating study of how many people, for them, Lewis was just a major help and encouragement in their faith, even rescuing people's faith that were they were struggling with their traditional upbringing, and he gave them a reason to believe. Yeah. I wonder, too, in answer to Aaron's question, uh, the whole gender issue, how much that figures there is in Suzanne Bray's book about uh, Sayers radio talks, um, someone alluding to this famous line by Samuel Johnson. And what Samuel Johnson is famous for saying, he was, of course, the 18th century um, journalist and literary critic. And writer of the first English dictionary. Oh, right. First dictionary. Um, Samuel Johnson once said, Sir, a woman's preaching is like a dog walking on its hind legs. It is not done well, but you are surprised to find it done at all. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of famous. Virginia Woolf made it famous because she reproduces mm-hmm. it in her book, uh, a, a Room of One's Own. But then someone, after listening to Dorothy Sayers' radio um, broadcast talks about Christianity, wrote in to say, In the way of accomplished exposition, I have seldom heard anything more admirable than Dorothy Sayers on the essentials of Christian belief. She tackled a most recalcitrant theological topic without making any concessions to mere piety. In one of his moods of elephantine obstinacy, Dr. Samuel Johnson once ridiculed the notion of a woman in the pulpit. I'd back Dorothy Sayers to put the case for Christianity better than many of our wireless padres. And if she will promise to abate a wayward high note in her voice, I will gladly listen to her for a month of Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> so that may be a good place to end with the reference to the wireless. Yes. And okay. thank you to all of our wireless padres out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, thanks for joining us, and we uh, keep all of you in our thoughts during these challenging times. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, fast collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about The Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.